All right. Hello. Just wait a few more minutes for some more attendees to jump on the call. So let me ask, how is this set up? Are, are there people in person at, at the book launch? Yes, afterwards, yes. Not right now, everyone's in front of their own screen, but afterwards we will get together here at the department. So I we're all sitting in our offices. <laughs> okay, that's a modern day meeting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Um, my name is Paris West. I'm with Cambridge University Press. Um, I think all of the attendees are muted, but if you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat or in the Q&A section. Um, this will be recorded, um, so we'll be able to view it on our YouTube channel afterwards. Um, so yeah, uh, if you have any questions, you know, feel free to pop them in the chat, but I will pass it on to uh, Katarina Sass and, uh, Thank you for attending the book launch. All right. Well, thank you so much, Paris. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to this book launch on the politics of comprehensive school reforms. Uh, thank you all for joining. I really look forward to this. I'd like to start with a special welcome and thanks to Terry um, M. Mo from Stanford University, who is editor of the series on uh, the comparative politics of education by Cambridge University Press. So Terry, we've been in touch since about 2018, I suppose. And your comments on my drafts and on the book have just been so helpful. Uh, really helped me to sharpen the argument of the book. So thank you for that and also for your encouragement along the way. So let me also welcome and introduce uh, Jane Gingrich from the University of Oxford and Johannes Westbeck from the University of Groningen. Thank you both so much for joining today. Jane is a political economist and uh, Johannes is a historian of education. Uh, I think that's a very good combination. So the two of them will comment on the book today. And um, I really look forward to hearing your thoughts. So finally, I'd like to say thank you to Paris West, who's my marketing contact at uh, Cambridge for setting up, helping me to organize today's event. So that was very good to get some help with. So now I will give the floor to Terry for about five minutes. He will say a few words on the series and the book. And then I will uh, give you a 10 minute summary of the book. And then Jane and Johannes will talk for about 15 minutes each and share their reflections and comments with us. And that will leave us about 10 to 15 minutes for a short discussion. And uh, as Terry said, you can, uh, the audience, you can write some, some questions or comments in the chat. So Terry, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Uh, well, I want to say that, that it's a real pleasure uh, to be here for the book launch. I'm sorry I, I couldn't be there in person, but uh, uh, remote uh, is, is certainly better than nothing. So it's a good way to participate, I think. Um, I am here because I'm the, the editor of the Com uh, Cambridge series on the comparative politics of education. Um, and I'm very proud and excited to have Katarina's new book included in the series. Uh, now, the series is just uh, several years old, and as you can imagine, uh, when you're getting going with a series like this, it's difficult to attract manuscripts and get them through the process. They have to be reviewed and revised and so on. It takes a while. Uh, so uh, uh, we have a lot in the pipeline, uh, but uh, Katharina's book is the second uh, to come out. Uh, we have others on, sort of on the verge of... Uh, coming out or being accepted. Um, so I think we'll have a fairly long list ultimately, uh, but she's the second. Now, the first book to come out in the series uh, was A Loud and Noisy Signal uh, by Busmeier, Gerritsmann, and Niemann, uh, which was a book about um, uh, public opinion on education reform issues across a number of European nations. Uh, it's uh, the largest and most comprehensive study of its kind by far, uh, and was a you know a real pathbreaking work. Um, and uh, uh, this year, it won the American Political Science Association's award for uh, the best book on the politics of education. Uh, and I I think uh, Katharina's book will definitely be a contender for that same award next year. Uh, so, so far, we have a great track record. Uh, now, I wanted to set up this series um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that 
You know, I, education just couldn't be more important um, uh, to all nations. Uh, education is the foundation for economic growth and for social well-being and for democratic citizenship and for social values and culture, um, all the sort of the fundamentals uh, of society. And so you'd think that uh, social scientists and especially political scientists would have a lot to say about uh, how these school systems emerge and how, how they are shaped by politics because ultimately these are political organizations. They're, they are governmental creations and they're shaped through the political uh, process. And we need to understand what that process is. Um, and for now, uh, we don't. Uh, I think the literature on the politics of education is very underdeveloped. Um, uh, it is filled with works that uh, unfortunately are, are often not very good. Um, and uh, the literature as a whole is fragmented and um, uh, really these things are, tend to be unconnected to one another. So we really haven't made a lot of progress uh, and a lot of these works are uh, not of the highest quality and they're lacking in rigor. So that's the main problem. I wanted to adopt this series to help attract high quality manuscripts and to give a boost to this literature and really move it forward. Um, all right, the, but there's something else as well. And that is that this literature, uh, as it stands, tends to focus on um, uh, vocational education and higher education, uh, but not much on uh, elementary and secondary education. Um, but elementary and secondary education, are, are, they're universal. Um, they are fundamental to economic growth and, you know, democratic citizenship and all the rest. Um, and uh, th their policies and organization are intensely political. And there have been uh, real concerns over the past decades that these systems are not performing well and that they need to be reformed in order to perform better. OK, well, these processes are intensely political. There are political battles that goes on. That go on. So how do we understand those battles? And how do we understand who wins and who loses? Okay, these things are just not studied well, and they need to be. Uh, so my second reason for setting up this series was to help encourage new work on elementary and secondary education systems, which have received short shrift so far. Okay, so uh, Katerina's book um, is the kind of book I was hoping to attract. You know, it is a work of exceptionally high quality. Uh, it's it's well researched. It's richly documented. It's carefully done. It's comparative, and it offers a novel theory that helps us understand why politics works as it does in the realm of education. Uh, also, her focus is on elementary and especially secondary education. Great. Um, and its topic is one of profound uh, historical importance, the battle for comprehensive education, uh, which is among developed nations, developed democratic nations, uh, ranks as probably the most fundamental and consequential education struggle of the entire 20th century. Uh, so she really couldn't have taken on a more important topic here. Um, and specifically, she explores the topic by comparing um, Norway and Sweden. In Norway, um, there was a movement for comprehensive education uh, that was driven by concerns uh, for social equality and for equal opportunity to make sure that all kids had access to a quality education and the kind of education, say an academic education, that they wanted. Um, uh, uh, the people who were opposed to comprehensive education uh, favored the more elitist system of the past where kids would be tracked, you know, when they were young, maybe 11 years old, 
um, into either a vocational track or out of school altogether, or into an academic track. And you can guess uh, which kids got tracked in which direction, right? So the kids who were less well off, whose parents didn't have a lot of money or weren't very well educated, those kids tended to get shunted off into the vocational track. And the more advantaged kids uh, were able to move into the academic trip. And, and this all, all sort of reinforced social inequalities. Um, so um, there were struggles in Norway and there were struggles in Germany uh, over these, these basic visions for education and the kinds of values that were involved. And in Norway, um, comprehensive education was ultimately adopted and in Germany it wasn't. Um, and so she looks at the politics in each country and attempts to explain what it was about the politics of education that led to these very different outcomes. So um, I'll leave the details to others. Uh, uh, you'll hear about them over the next hour. Uh, for now, I'll just say that Katharina's book uh, makes an important contribution. And it's just the kind of contribution I was hoping to attract to the Cambridge series on the comparative politics of education. Uh, so um, I want to commend Katharina for um, a job well done in writing such a fine book. And I now turn it over to Katharina and others to talk in much greater detail about her project. Thank you. Thank you so much, Terry. Let me share my screen here. Okay. So let me try a 10 minute introduction. <laughs> Not so easy, but let's see how it goes. So in the introduction, I am. Um, of this book. So let me just go through the contents quickly. So first, obviously, I discussed the literature on, on this. And as you said, it's not that much. And also the theoretical framework, which is power resources theory and Rokanian cleavage theory. And um, then there is a historical chapter on the development of Norwegian and German school systems until the 1950s. That's followed by a chapter introducing the main collective actors um, in education politics, giving an overview of playing fields and analyzing the distribution of power resources and also actor social base. In the fourth uh, chapter, I look at the actual reforms, the comprehensive school reforms and reform attempts from the late 50s until the, um, around 1980 showing how the left and the right were divided over these reforms in line with what Stein Rokan has called the class cleavage. And then in chapter five, I kind of get to the main argument of the book, which is that cross-cutting cleavages and cross-cutting issues related to religion and centralization, language, anti-communism and gender had a very important influence on the development of different kinds of alliances in these two cases. Um, yeah, and finally, I discuss some implications of this, um, speculate a little bit uh, on the situation today in the concluding chapter. But beyond that, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about the history of this book. So I wrote my proposal on this topic, my PhD proposal in 2012. But I've really been struggling with under, trying to understand education politics ever since I was a teenager myself. So I went to school in Cologne, uh, which is in Northern Australia, uh, one of the cases of my book. And it's the most populated federal state. Uh, and it was dominated politically by social democracy since 1966. Uh, but it's also a place where political Catholicism has really played an important role. And I think in that sense, it's um, representative of Germany as a whole, as a nation that has been denominationally split. So let me just quickly remind you what the school system looked like when I was a student and for the most part still looks like today. So there's this four year primary school and then at age 10 children are divided onto different school types and um, the most prestigious one is the gymnasium leading up to the RB2 exam. And the Hauptschule is the least prestigious school type. So I went to a sort of regular middle-class gymnasium and we shared our school grounds with a Hauptschule. And it was quite plain to everyone that there was this difference, this social division, right? Which was something that bothered me as a, even as a teenager somehow, you know? And I wondered, you know, why is it like that? 
So um, later I studied sociology. I learned about the work done by sociologists of education. I learned, for example, that a very large percentage of Hauptschule students are pretty much doomed to a life of poverty and social exclusion. I mean, statistically speaking, of course. And more generally, ever since the 60s, just lots of research on German education has reproduced the same finding, which is that this early organizational differentiation from age 10 reproduces inequality quite massively, right? So as an empirical finding, that's very well established. And that entails the question, uh, you know, how come that so many people in Germany think that this is the best way to organize a school system? So where does this legitimacy come from? Uh, especially considering that politicians regularly proclaim their desire for equality of opportunity. So that was a question I struggled with um, even as a teenager, actually. And then somehow I ended up in Norway. <laughs> I started learning about the Norwegian education system and how Norwegian politicians in the course of the 60s and the 70s had introduced nine years of comprehensive education by introducing this common youth school for everyone and by abolishing two older secondary school types, the Realschule and the Framhaltsschule. And I became very intrigued by this, right? I wanted to get to the bottom of how that kind of reform was possible in Norway, but not in Germany. Because also in Germany, actually, a similar reform was attempted by social democrats and some liberal school reformers. And the result was the introduction of this integrated comprehensive school. But of course, it didn't really become comprehensive because the other school types were not abolished. So my research question became this. Now, why was this abolition of parallel schooling, tracking, ability grouping, and also grading actually carried through out in Norway, but not in Germany, uh, or it remained limited in scope? And why also were these reforms so contested in Germany, but not in Norway? So I decided to really dig down into the historical material, analyze party, um, parliamentary debates, documents, and party manifestos, uh, documents by teacher organizations, and lots of secondary sources. And then very importantly, I did uh, 23 interviews with time witnesses or experts who um, had been involved in education politics for a long time. And some of them are actually here today, which is great. <laughs> and uh, these interviews were just extremely important. Because when I embarked on this project, I had this preliminary theoretical assumption, which was that somehow the different outcomes were a result of power differences between the left and the right. So that was my hunch, which was backed by stuff I'd read, um, German sociology of education, the important work done by Susanne Wieburg and others on this topic, and theoretically speaking, by power resources theory. So here's a picture of Walter Korpi, but also Esping Andersen and others who've worked on the development of welfare states. So I figured most of this is about class conflict or class politics somehow, but also about cross-class coalitions somehow, which is something that power resources uh, theorists have been interested in. Then I did these interviews, and step by step, I realized, well, yes, you know, it is about class and uh, power resources, but it's actually more complicated than that. And in parallel, I was also reading Stein Ocon, and I discovered that the Rukanian framework on cleavage has really resonated with, with what I was finding in the field, because a lot of the people who were politically active at the time in, in school politics had motivations that just had very little to do with class. So what did they care about? So in the Norwegian case, the politicians of the small, the three small center parties, the Liberals, the Farmers Party and the Christian Democrats, but also the Socialist Left Party, they cared about the quality of rural schools. And uh, also they didn't want to have too much centralization. They also cared about language. They supported new Norwegian, and that was a highly polarized and emotional issue in Norway, as I show in the book. And many primary school teachers also cared about these issues very much. And then especially the small Christian Democratic Party, but also the Farmers Party cared about Christian education. And there were struggles about the Christian preamble of the school law and about Christian private schools. And finally, also the women's movement and female teachers were involved in debates about um, girls' education. While in uh, Northern Westphalia, one really important issue, or the most important issue until the mid 60s was actually denominational schooling because public schools were either Catholic or Protestant. And that was very important to the Christian Democrats who in this area were predominantly Catholic 
um, and also Christian private schools, especially Catholic private schools, were very important for the CDU and for the Catholic population, and not least for the Catholic teachers and their teachers' organizations, because the teachers were also divided by the nomination. And then there was also very widespread anti-communism, also within social democracy. Social democracy was highly split, and that caused a lot of problems for school reformers because comprehensive schooling was associated with communism, right? And it was hard to unite the social democrats behind these reforms. And then centralization and girls' education were also topics that were debated, but not these issues were not quite as salient as in Norway. So theoretically speaking, I claim that all of these issues are expressions of cross-cutting cleavages in the sense that they cross-cut the left-right dimension of politics. So they're not primarily about class, but they're expressions of other cleavages. And in the Norwegian case, the center periphery and the rural urban conflicts were most important for the outcome because they split the conservatives and the center party. So for the Norwegian conservatives, it was really difficult to handle these issues. And in Germany, the state church conflict was central to the internal unity of the Christian Democrats as a cross-class party. And um, anti-communist ideology also united the CDU, but split social democracy. So these cleavages had consequences for coalition building, for actors' internal unity or lack of unity. So to sum up, my argument is that um, coalitions and education politics can only be understood in light of the cleavage structure as a whole, because cross-cutting cleavages shape actors' interests, ideologies, and inclinations for who they want to cooperate with or not. And in the Norwegian case, social democrats managed to include peripheral, rural, and women's interests in their comprehensive school reform packages, while in the German case, Christian, especially Catholic and rural interests were integrated by the CDU. So in this process, relatively similar social groups turned into concentrists to comprehensive schooling in the Norwegian case, but into antagonists in the German case. And I think that's an insight that could potentially be fruitful for the analysis of other policy fields too. But let's see what Jane and Johannes have to say about that. Thank you very much. So then, um, Jane, I give the floor to you. Let me see. Jane, you're on mute, by the way. Sorry, everyone, I'm not doing very well. Um, thank you, Katerina, for inviting me and apologies for the um, for the uh, problems um, getting started. Um, so first of all, I just wanna echo what Terry said at the beginning, which is that this is a really wonderful book. Um, it is an incredibly well-researched and, really rich piece of work that digs into these two cases in this very careful, very detailed way, but comes up for, for air from them to say something I think that is really theoretically important for thinking about the way in which um, comprehensive schools were reformed. And as Katarina said at the end, of thinking about some of the things that we can we can take out of this into sort of broader education or welfare politics. And I, I know Johannes is the expert on the history of comprehensive schooling. So I wanted to talk about this a little bit more from this sort of political science perspective. And then we can dig in a little bit to, um, to the um, questions historically. Okay. So the first question we kind of might have is sort of how do we, how should we think about the politics of comprehensive education? And as Terry said in his introduction, um, there's a number of ways in which political scientists have really looked at the politics of education. And I think all of these leave really important questions when it comes to the politics of comprehensive schooling for, for a series of reasons. So the first is, and I think the kind of dominant way we might anticipate this, and Katarina set this up in her, in her um, introductory comments, is that we might think about education as sort of like a form of redistribution. So it, as we expand education, it redistributes resources to new groups. Um, as we contract it, it, it maybe cuts resources to those groups. And a, a political scientists, political economists, economists, we know a lot about the politics of redistribution. So maybe we can just apply that sort of full scale to um, 
education and come up with some hypotheses. And this is the way Katerina even described the beginning sort of approach that she took to the politics of comprehensive schooling, which is to say, okay, let's just take welfare state theory. And we know a lot about sort of why welfare states are bigger in some contexts than others. And there is this strong elective affinity between the structure of the welfare state and detracking in that the Nordic countries that developed these large social democratic welfare states also tended to develop um, comprehensive schools in ways that look different than the, the continental European welfare states that are more stratified and also contain more stratified schooling and the liberal welfare states that are more heterogeneous. And so maybe we can just look at the same processes that existed there and apply them to the educational structure. But as her kind of preliminary comments, and as she really convincingly shows in the book, there are some problems with doing that. And the problems are that the coalitions that came together and the actors that came together around this, while not unrelated to those that um, expanded the welfare state, were not motivated in a singular sense by distributive issues. There were sort of a broader range of motivations that had to do um, with the structure of control over education, the standardization of education, and so on. And so if we want to capture that politics, we need to go beyond thinking about comprehensive reform as primarily or, or only about sort of distributive issues, even though they very clearly intersect with them in many important ways. And so my picture on here of the kind of grammar schools in the UK, I mean, in the British case, it's a, that it's sort of wound up with left-right issues. But I think as Katerina shows very successfully in her book, even in the in the Nordic um, countries in Norway, where clearly this is linked into sort of social dem democracy and the way in which social democrats mobilize power and, and the vision they have for a more redistributive labor market and state, the actors that, that come into this story in terms of promoting comprehensive education are much more heterogeneous than just class-based actors, and we need a framework to understand that. So the second way we might think about this is, um, okay, this is about skills. And so the reason that you get broader coalitions in education than you do in um, welfare or coalitions that look different is that you draw on economic actors who care about human capital. And um, we all know the sort of ideas related to varieties of capitalism and other frameworks that suggest that, you know, that maybe the reason we end up with more stratified systems in some cases is because of structures of vocational training, which provide these kind of firm specific skills in which economic producers coalesce around. And I think that's a compelling story, but it doesn't, again, it doesn't quite get us the full way there in many regards in part because um, as the Nordic cases show, it's very possible to combine high quality vocational training with uh, detract comprehensive schooling at the lower secondary level. And also because uh, when we go back to the historical record as Katerina shows in her work, um, in both cases, the primary actors mobilizing either for or against comprehensive schooling were not uh, primarily economic producers or um, firms that required specific vocational skills. And so it just, this alone doesn't kind of get us up to the, um, to the, to the story about the kind of imp the record, the historical record. A third way to kind of think about this is, okay, well, maybe it doesn't have so much to do with either distributive issues or skills. It's about forms of social control, um, the power of um, actors in state building processes, and so on. And again, I think this gets us to some of the story. And certainly in the um, German case, Katarina shows very con convincingly that um, the role of the church as a, as a, an antagonist towards some of these comprehensive reforms was important, and that partly rested on the church's very strong vested interest in maintaining some control over the structure of education for young people um, as, a, as a, a sort of a broader cultural strategy. But again, um, the variation across countries uh, in this regard, um, in, in sort of thinking about it in this very generic regard, um, isn't explained entirely by, by just thinking about these incentives over social control. And then there's a final perspective that I think is, um, you know, some of Terry's colleagues in the um, sociology department at Stanford have really uh, been very important contributors to that really thinks about education as part of these global processes of sort of isomorphic processes that are promoted by international actors. And there's a very nice article um, by Jeremy Furuta that looks at this with respect to detracking, where he argues that, you know, over time, the concept of detracking becomes part of this sort of global system of definitions of what it means to be a mod modern education system. And thus it sort of diffuses uh, internationally 
um, as countries sort of update their ideas of what it means to be a sort of a liberal modern education system. But again, I think SAS is on very strong ground here. Katarina is on very strong ground here. It's sort of going back historically and saying that these were at this point in time, actually, these countries were pioneers in this process. And um, these these conceptions, these sort of global conceptions of modernity were not um, dominant. So then that that really leaves us with this puzzle, like what are the theoretical tools we have as political scientists to explain this important um, this important phenomenon? And I think Katarina draws on, on these two kinds of perspectives, power resource and the Rotanian theory very successfully to make um, a set of uh, broader claims. So the first is she she draws on a claim. She I wouldn't say she re, she adopts um, Terry's perspective in a in a public choice sense at all. Um, she has a very different way of thinking about um, actors within the education sector. But I think she takes the point that I would really associate with some of Terry's work and others and Suzanne Reborg's and others' work. Um, which is to say that we need to take seriously the people that work in the education sector. And those those are teachers, um, but they're also church actors and they're also local governments and others that have very heterogeneous interests um, in combination with the more traditional electoral and economic actors that we might have conceptualized or theorized in the, in the study of education. So if we think about all of these actors in a space, you have the teachers, you have the churches, you have um, parties that are representing constituencies that may that look more sort of heterogeneous than just class-based constituencies and and you sort of on the peripheral on the perif periphery of that you have economic actors that might care about the kinds of skills that that we see then we've got a we've got a complicated and and um heterogeneous space for thinking about politics of education so we want to put some framework on that that's that takes seriously the, the, those actors and the way that in which they come together and simplifies that conceptually, but also remains accurate to the historical record. And I think that Katarina's book does this really successfully because what she does is she, she takes a step back and she looks at comprehensive education, I think, um, in two ways that are really illuminating. So first, she thinks about the actual outcome itself, comprehensive schooling, as involving something more than just a sort of a distributive or a skills-based move, but one in which that sort of changes the geography, the language, um, the curriculum for kids in a variety of ways that can either bring coalitions together or split them apart. And secondly, she really maps the actors around that in a very systematic way to think about sort of how preferences of different groups could come together. So I think there's three critical claims that um, that the book pulls out that are really important. So the first is, as um, as she as Katarina said in her introductory um, um, comments, she thinks about the cleavage structure in a multi-dimensional space, and so there are certainly dominant actors in both countries who are motivated by class-based issues. And so the conventional kind of distributive story, education as a form of redistribution, that's not absent here. It's an incredibly important part of the underlying demand structure for comprehensive schooling. And so left-wing parties pretty much everywhere in the 1960s and 70s um, we're demanding some form of comprehensive schooling. And so the distributive angle is there. But the problem with thinking about this is purely distributive, as I said a moment ago, and as Katarina made very clear in her opening um, introduction, is that that's not all comprehensive schooling did. Comprehensive schooling often involved the standardization of um, educational structures across a geographic space. It involved curricular changes. And crucially, it involved employment changes for teachers. So one of the the um, questions that emerged in all countries debating comprehensive schooling was whether um, set, primary school teachers would become the new sort of comprehensive school teachers, or whether there there would be um, an extension, uh, downward extension of sort of secondary school teachers into the lower secondary, er, uh, the lower secondary now sort of combined primary, lower secondary comprehensive schools. And so there were a lot of actors that have much more heterogeneous preferences that are not just this left, right. And so what I think what Katarina does really well in this is she, she says, okay, there's this kind of big dimension of conflict that exists in, in pretty much every case that's about uh, class, 
But layered onto that, there's all these other actors who have different preferences that are in somewhat um, created by the historical structure of the education system. And these actors are the ones that can become allies or antagonists for the uh, pro proponents of comprehensive schooling. And so this link between the historic cleavage structures and the and then really thinking through how that maps onto these reforms that involve that really hit on the interests of multiple actors in the system, I think really theoretically advances our understanding of the way in which the politics of these organizational changes are playing out in a particular moment in time. And then the second thing, or the third thing she does that sort of advances our understanding of this in a more general sense is that she theorizes the way in which these coalitions come together. So in the um, the Norwegian case, as, as she said in her introduction, what we see is um, both the sort of fragmentation of parts of the um, sort of antagonist group. And so the, the kinds of groups that got together really um, to systematically to block comprehensive reform in other countries, which tended to be sort of religious actors combined with um, upper secondary teachers, combined with um, conservative, uh, maybe urban-based conservative voters and their representatives, that these groups are in some regards fragmented by the historic structure of the Norwegian state in which you have linguistic divisions and you also have these urban rural divisions that don't allow these actors to sort of come together to successfully block. Um, and that allows the actors that uh, the left, the political left to make coalitions with other kind of pro-reform actors like the primary school teachers in a way that sort of um, cement these very extensive comprehensive reforms. By contrast, in the German case, you have much more powerful actors that are able to block these reforms. Um, and again, you get a heterogeneous coalition there, but the coalition has a common interest in, in preserving the gymnasium and the track structure in ways that then don't allow the social democrats to make more than sort of small inroads through experimental schools. And so this approach provides a very detailed and theoretically rich way of thinking about this process in which she conceptualizes both the kind of primacy of a class coalition, but with these other actors built around it to allow us to understand sort of why we end up with very stable coalitions coming together around reform in one place and stable sort of blocking coalitions in another. And we can think about other cases that are sort of in the middle in which there's actually sort of more instability over time. And I want to kind of highlight this one um, picture in um, Sass's book, which is figures 4.1 and 4.2, because I could just know how many probably years of work went into getting to this conceptualization, but being able to put actors um, and you can just see that and just from a perspective of research that every one of these kind of dots she's drawn on the, the picture to sort of place these actors in political space involved intense archival research. She's really compelling at showing, here's where these groups were, here's how they lined up, and here's the coalition space that allowed reforms that took a particular form to come together. And what's interesting about this is that in some regards, what we see in both cases is that actually there's actors all over the political space. So you have left and right and you have antagonists and protagonists. But you, what you don't have in Germany that you do have in um, Norway is the sort of fragmentation of the right and the ability of the left to dominate that in terms of pulling things forward. And um, this then, this sort of systematic mapping of the space and the theorization of it um, really allows us to sort of see how these things come together and why the left is able to win in some cases and others. And this is not just derivative of the general electoral context, but the way teachers are organized, the way the church is organized, and then the way the political right is fragmented based on or not based on these different um, features. And so I think this is a, just a really, a, a really elegant, really well-researched and nice um, way of thinking about things. And it, and it very much advances um, our understanding. So a few questions to kind of end with in terms of thinking forward, because I also work on the politics of comprehensive schooling and detracking. And some of the things I've learned from Katarina's work have really helped me kind of formulate some of my own research questions and, and thinking forward. So I think the first thing to kind of push on is that is to think a little bit more about could we be more systematic at thinking about sort of what comprehensive schooling involves and so in the the sort of 
comparison of Norway and Sweden, Norway is a case that sort of does the full comprehensive model to some extent. So there's um, detracking, but there's also shortly thereafter, there's new curriculum, there's debates about grading, as um, the book shows very carefully. Um, there's a, a, a lot of standardization across linguistic groups, across urban and rural that happen all at the same time as the extension of compulsory education. So you get the sort of full package of comprehensive schooling. And in Germany, we see um, to some extent the blocking of a lot of those reforms. Uh, although it's worth pointing out, and certainly the, as the book also shows, there's plenty of reforms that are happening in North Rhine-Westphalia around this time. I mean, and, and certainly in um, Germany as a whole, there's curricular changes, there's bridges that are layered onto the track system. There's all sorts of um, reforms that do occur. But in the middle, and this is something that kind of intrigues me, is, is that there's, there's countries that sort of mix and match these much more extensively. So the French are a good example of this, where they combine um, aspects of detracking with uh, much less investment in the kinds of um, comprehensive standardized curricular structures, training of new teachers, um, reducing electives, restructuring grading than the Norwegians do. So we need to think like when we're thinking about the outcome and saying, okay, how would we apply what, what um, SAS is really showing in this book to the broader range of cases and say like, when do we get these kinds of reforms? We want to think about our, like, what is the outcome variable and how does it actually sort of vary beyond these cases? And I think what SAS does to sort of is to draw our attention to the way in which these can be organized in different ways because they build on these different coalitions that have different interests. And that draws our attention to potentially thinking about um, a number of other issues that might be behind the comprehensive reform movement. So in some countries, you may end up with a political left that gets a constituency to detract, but they can't overcome, say, vested interests amongst teachers in, uh, in parts of the employment relations. So you end up with ongoing um, setting within the schools. You end up with a, elite paths like Latin re related paths that allow some of this implicit tracking to go forward. And I think SAS gives us some theoretical tools for understanding when that's going to happen. The second thing I would like to kind of push on is this coalition space. So in some regards in the book, the coalition space, the sort of um, Rokanian coalitions are sort of dealt from the past. Um, and so you end up with these sort of inherited coalitions from the 19th century that then structure the way in which politics in the 20th century um, operates. But I wonder if we could we could sort of extend that framework a little bit further instead of thinking about these as sort of just legacies, but but really thinking about actors as having strategic interests that are shaped by where they are in the system. And so is the church in Germany a kind of a legacy of a longstanding kind of Rokanian coalition? Or is the church a much more, if I take, if I draw inspiration from Terry um, on this call, is it much more a kind of an actor that has a vested interest because it is a, a provider of some of these schools um, and it specializes in them. And we can think about its position as much more sort of created by its, by its position in the uh, relative to the uh, overall structure of the um, system itself. And I think it would be interesting to hear a little bit more about how you concept, how she, Katarina conceptualizes these, these coalitions as sort of historic features, inherited features, or as things that we might be able to sort of pull out of that context and think about sort of more systematically sort of where actors are relative to the institutions and how their interests might be shaped by that to sort of um, affect education politics. The third thing um, to kind of push on is well, the comprehensive debate really dominates, as, as Terry said in his introductory comments, the, the, much of the sort of middle part of the 20th century. But in most countries, it basically in Europe dies down by the by the late 1970s. There are in the Nordic countries some sort of last gasps of the comprehensive debate in the early 1990s um, around grading and so on. Um, but but these things sort of fall off the agenda. And it would be interesting to hear a little bit more about why that's the case, whether there's something sort of path dependent about these processes that they play out and then the actors that uh, the proponents, the protagonists sort of lose steam um, or whether um, 
some of these kinds of di dynamics that um, Katarina points to in his book move to new spheres, say debates about marketization, decentralization, and so on, that occur, that sort of pick up testing and um, uh, monitoring testing and so on, that pick up steam in the 1980s, 90s, and 2000s. And and then that sort of raises this question about sort of how we think about this kind of theoretical framework in which you have actors that to some extent um, are embedded in this space that have these different interests um, and how sticky these early debates um, really are. Is this a story that is really specific to the period of educational expansion where there is some real possibility for change? Or are there things that we can take forward in thinking about the politics of reform in a more mature education system where the expansion dynamics um, essentially have already happened? So I'll stop there. Thank you. So Johannes, your turn, I suppose. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much and see if I can also uh, share my screen in a reasonable uh, way. Let's see. Now I hope that you have uh, uh, can see my screen. So uh, First of all, thank you very much for inviting me for uh, this uh, uh, and provide some perspectives on this book. I really enjoyed reading it. Uh, and I, I agree very much with Jane that this is a very rich uh, book. So there, therefore, I will do this quite quickly. Uh, just highlight some of the kind of dimensions of this book or some of the stories of this book that I find uh, particularly intriguing. Uh, and I also was also happy to be invited together with Jane because I think I provide another perspective then highlighting more uh, the history of education perspective on this book and how this book contributes to that uh, field of research. Uh, because history of education is for sure an interdisciplinary uh, field with an emphasis in the disciplines of education and I think also in the discipline of, of the or disciplines of history. And often these disciplines are quite kind of distant to, uh, to the discussion going on in political science or in economics. Uh, so in that sense, I think this book is a, a great starting point for discussion about interdisciplinary disciplinarity. And I also think that the interdisciplinary appeal is certainly something uh, one of the strengths of your book, because as a historian, as I am a historian of education in Trondheim, uh, often this kind of comparative works can be perceived as being kind of too scarce in uh, information, too simplified in its comparison. Uh, while in your case, you really are able to, to combine this comparative analysis with, with the richness that you would expect from a uh, work in history of education. So what I would like to kind of highlight just then uh, quickly uh, is five things that, that I really kind of think that your your book communicates uh, well with five items or five stories that I would like to highlight with your book. The first one is really that I think that uh, you contribute to this kind of history of post-war expansion in schooling. So that is kind of a broader historiography of education that you, you contribute to uh, in a good way. Uh, and this links to some of the works that you make reference to regarding kind of the expansion of primary schooling during the 19th century and the kind of some of the features of uh, secondary schooling during the 19th century. So it's this kind of historiography that really deals with the kind of complexities of educational systems uh, uh, that deals with this shift from this kind of 19th century setting that you also make reference to in your book, where uh, secondary education for sure was an elite education for a selected few, just a couple of percent of the school age population, which had some kind of interesting features with this kind of leading institutions of the gymnasiums, the Lyceus, the Liceo Classicos, and the Swedish Lärverk, for example. 
which had certain features such as the kind of this really important conflict between classical tracks and the modern tracks, uh, which had this kind of interesting uh, feature of the the end exam, the the back, the French back or the German abitur, uh, and had really the, this gender aspect for men only, which really gave it this extremely, which sometimes it's really, I think, difficult to understand this extremely limited uh, volumes, uh, which you can see both when you look at student enrollments in the 19th century throughout Europe, but also when you look at this kind of famous uh, universities uh, of, of Germany, uh, of, of Berlin, of Tübingen, of uh, Göttingen, that hardly anyone attended. Uh, and, and what I think your book does so well is to make an analysis uh, of the expansion uh, that uh, followed. Uh, your book is really kind of a book on the politics, of course, of, of comprehensive schooling uh, and its varying uh, trajectories. Uh, but it then also contributes to our understanding of this kind of amazing post-war uh, educational uh, developments, like the post-war educational revolution. Uh, so I would really kind of want you uh, all to remember that this is not only a book on the politics uh, of comprehensive schooling, but it's also a, a book on the politics of post-war educational expansion. Uh, and a book on this remarkable shift between 19th century education and 20th century education. So I think you provide new insights uh, into this some kind of educational miracle, so to speak. Of course, it's also a book on comprehensive school reforms. Uh, and in this sense, uh, I think it would be interesting, you, you do this very well, but it would also be interesting to perhaps in a follow-up article to make sure that you communicate even more with this field because I think this book is so much on, uh, an important uh, contribution to this field that kind of has studied how in one way the massification of secondary education starts in the US and you can really kind of I think you have really interesting things you could do in comparison for example with the work of Claudia Golden, uh, the economic historian. Uh, tries to explain kind of the massification of secondary education in the US and its its impact uh, and how the European countries in that respect lagged so far uh, behind. And I think you really provide an interesting uh, perspective on that. And in that sense, it's for sure a really interesting contribution to all this work that has done, been done on comprehensive school reform, perhaps not so much in political science or sociology, and certainly not always from a kind of comparative perspective, uh, but you really can add uh, your perspective to, to this work that often has more kind of intense and deep focus on debates, on a local implementation or national or regional policy. And I think in that sense, one of the things that I really get from your book is I want more of these books. <laughs> Because there are so many interesting attempts at introducing comprehensive schooling, some more successful and some less successful. That apart from the famous successful ones in the Nordics, you have the, the Dutch experiments with the middle schools, uh, the attempts in Belgium and Ireland. And you have this really kind of interesting development in Italy that in some ways actually was quite uh, successful in extending uh, the amount of school years. Uh, so in that sense, uh, just to keep it short, uh, I want more of these studies. Uh, for example, just comparing the Netherlands and, and Sweden would be interesting, which Sweden, which has kind of a similar uh, uh, conditions uh, as the Norwegian case and Norway also, uh, Netherlands also like affinity to the German case, but not. So uh, in that sense, uh, I would just highlight how this is a really, a really important contribution to this kind of historical uh, and educational work on comprehensive school reforms that we need more of. Uh, and it sounds also, just to keep it short, uh, I really enjoy how this is this also comparative education and it's also transnational history. It's a tweak, of course, it's not using the transnational uh, terminology and so forth, but it's for sure also uh, a book that is 
fits well in both to this kind of studies that has compared Germany and the Nordics. Uh, it's really interesting uh, addition to this uh, field of like Nordics Germany comparisons. Uh, but it's also with your theoretical framework that Jane highlighted with power source uh, theory and Rockanian cleavage theory. It is, as you also shown in one of your articles, it's, it's a really interesting contribution to the field of history and history of education. And if I would like to kind of continue to see, it would be interesting to know more. It would be how you would... Uh, if you used your theoretical framework, how you would link your research to that of historical institutionalists uh, and how you would link that to studies that really has emphasized timing, uh, sequence and path dependence. This is for sure something that you communicate with, uh, but talking about kind of various ways forward for you and for others in this field, I think it would be really interesting to see how you could contribute uh, to this kind of research. And in that way, I would really be interesting to kind of highlight more of the, also the educational institutions, uh, because you do that. But if you really kind of continue, for example, in, in the case of Sweden, I tried to map uh, the parallel school system of the 1930s, with, which was truly hopeless. Uh, and in the Swedish case, for example, just these educational institutions and this educational system was for sure fundamental in deciding the road forward. Uh, so I think uh, it would be interesting, perhaps some other time, if it, since we don't have much time here, to hear you talk more about uh, these kind of uh, perspectives. But last then and not least, I think this book is important, uh, starting from contemporary debate, not the least in Nordic countries and not least in Sweden, uh, there is this perceived crisis of comprehensive schooling and uh, the public debate uh, in various kinds of media is often filled with a, a kind of conservative uh, critique of the current comprehensive uh, school, uh, which is featured most recently, I think, in, in a book, a uh, Padre book on, uh, that was uh, called The Dumbing Down. And this kind of conservative critique is, of course, really simplistic in some ways. It, it blames the faults of the school system often on kind of comprehensive school reforms and links it to uh, progressive education and John Dewey to postmodernism, to constructivism, to left wing educationalists and this kind of left wing striving for equality. And I think one of the main contributions that your book can make to this really simplified and of course in many ways just straight out wrong debate is that can you, you can show really on the complexities of these power relations and the complexities of all these topics uh, that was a really important part of the debate it wasn't about a kind of progressivism only or kind of left-wing politics but it was about a struggler that kind of circle around this kind of themes of uh, rural schools in Norway, also language struggle, Christian education, and so forth. So you add the really kind of needed complexity that I hope that you, that really can be kind of communicated to an often to a simplistic uh, public debate. So this was a quick run through of some uh, some of the dimensions of your book that I wanted to highlight. Uh, and by that also congratulate you to a, a really fine book. Thank you very much. Well, thank you both so much, uh, all three of you, um, for really interesting comments. And I'm afraid we're kind of running out of time here, which is a pity, <laughs> but I suppose it was too optimistic, one hour. <laughs> um, let me just, I can't comment on all of what you said, but I totally agree uh, with Jane that it would be very um, interesting to do more research on the dynamics of these debates, how they change over time and what happened in the 70s is one of the questions I discussed in the con uh, con conclusion as well. You know, there was something about the economy, right? Uh, that there was a time of crisis and things just, dy debates, dynamics really changed, but that would be something to look at more and also historical institutionalism i agree with you um 
Johannes, that I, I use some of the terms uh, like feedback effects and I'm talking about a critical juncture. So yeah, they are clearly, um, yeah, uh, could I could speak more clearly to that literature as well, yes. But anyways, I'm afraid we'll have to wrap it up because we've promised people this will only take an hour. <laughs> But I would just like to say thank you again so much for joining here today and for your really interesting remarks. Um, yeah, so and thank, thanks to all of you for joining today. Thank you all for attending. I don't see any questions in the chat, but um, mm -hmm. some of us are getting together now here at the department and I'm really looking forward to that. Too bad that you <laughs> panelists can't join us. <laughs> Yeah. But uh, this was fun. And I hope we can get together physically at some point and actually meet each other. That would be great. Thank you all for all right. attending. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye bye.